we are live. All right. Always the, the tenuous technological moment of going live. Um, how are you, folks? Thanks for, thanks for stopping in. Um, this is a weird one, you know. Um, my name's Andre Chumley. We're here at Make Weird Music and our various broadcasting uh, uh, um, areas, namely YouTube and etc. But uh, this show is a special edition of the Gear Spotlight. And um, as you know, on the Gear Spotlight, I kind of talk about equipment and gear and, 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 and the creative workflow, you know, what people use to get to a certain place. Tonight is a special edition because I realized it was the 20th anniversary of this really fantastic record by a fantastic artist, this record, Go Plastic. And it was released this day, the 25th of, of June, uh, 2001. And, um, you know, let me say a couple quick things before I introduce my, my fantastic panel. Uh, let me say that this is not the greatest album this man has done. This is not the greatest electronic album in the world, anything like that. Because I know sometimes that's, uh, you know, a perception there. As a matter of fact, uh, just uh, his his debut album, um, Feed Me Weird Things, just became 25, and his record company released that. So, you know, there's that. But I thought this was a good one, and I thought the number 20 was cool. And I also thought, most of all, it's an excuse to present some some friends of mine, um, some old, some new, um, and who are electronic musicians, who are modern working musicians, and, and talk about this past 20 years of electronic music. So that's kind of the setup, and, and the glue kind of holding us together is celebrating this album. So, so without further ado, I'm going uh, to jump to, to, my, to my panel here, and let's just make sure all of the technology is working. Um, all right. I'm gonna start out with um, I'm gonna start out with my namesake. I'm gonna start out with Mr. Andre Lafosse, um, who is wow, a guitarist, a composer, a, a, a soundtrack guy, and and a looping uh, phew, wow, a Renaissance man, really. I mean, I met him because of the looping uh, uh, news groups. We used to have list serves. It, yeah, it, I, it was the Looper's Delight mailing list in '96. In in the nineties, and um, yeah. learned to learn to uh, learned a lot of his music, and and have done shows with him actually, and uh, we've become very good friends over the years. Um, so we're gonna go through some of the things he does, but he's a guitarist, a looper, a composer. Ladies and gentlemen, Andre Lafosse, how are you today? I'm very well. Glad to glad to be here with all of you folks. That's fantastic. Uh, and then someone who's a new friend, and um, uh, her, her, they. She goes as her or they, and, and Andre goes by he, right? Andre, he and him, is that, can you hear me? Oh, yes, okay. yes. Oh, yeah, okay, awesome. Uh, and, and I'd like you to meet someone who's a new friend and um, met her uh, the, f the, the final gig of the, of, uh, right before we went into lockdown. So I was just saying uh, off air that I have not seen a show. We have not seen a show since we saw Wizard. So I'd like, I'd like you to meet someone who is new to this channel also. And um, we're going to meet her tonight. And I'm going to struggle to try to capture in words, as I will all three of you. But she's a composer, a songwriter, singer, multi-instrumentalist, multimedia performance artist. Because, I mean, you, you go through the, the videos and there's all manner of creative tools being used um also a renaissance human being um ladies and gentlemen wizard apprentice how are you <laughs> hello thank you i was very like hype <laughs> i appreciate the hype of the introduction <laughs> really <laughs> it makes me feel affirmed <laughs> well it's it's uh let me um i gotta fix this so we can see everyone um it's 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 all true you know like i said this is a sneaky way to just bring together Three really cool <laughs> people, three really cool musicians. Um, and, and last but not least, somebody that I met also on the Loopers group, um, God, 25 years ago, 
uh, again, it was just email. We didn't even have images. But um, th- this is um, a-, a gentleman, uh, Todd, he, him, Todd, uh, 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 who is, um, again, I struggle w- with all of y'all. But he's a violinist, composer, uh, also a songwriter, and like all of us, grappling with the new technology and, and, and figuring our way forward. Um, this is a man that's a teacher. Uh, he teaches music, and, and he's been involved with some amazing uh, stalwarts in uh, our modern avant-garde, our, our, our 20, 20th and 21st century music, whether it's Meredith Monk or Bang on a Can or Steve Reich or touring with Todd Rundgren and Joe Jackson. I, I've seen him on all those stages, and I'm honored to call him also a dear friend. Todd Reynolds, how are you? I'm great, Andre. Thank you so much for having me here tonight. Lovely to be invited. Such a blast, such a blast. Well, let, let's start with, uh, again, uh, as I said at the top, we're going to talk a bunch about this record because it's kind of a, a touch point, you know. Um, and, and one of the things I want to uh, ask you all first, uh, and I'll start with you, Todd, is, um, you know, th- this record also marks a really amazing 20 years, I think, in electronic music. We've got all these new tools now, software, hardware, you can't keep up. Artists, all kinds of amazing people. And also amazing is the diversity that's starting to happen. You're starting to see artists from around the world, uh, artists of different races, genders, religions, economic strata. So uh, to me, it's been an amazing 20 years. So I want to frame it with that. Starting with you, Todd, when you, um, if, if, you, if you ran into a stranger who's never heard this record, what would you say? How would you describe Square Pusher and Go Plastic? I would probably, say, you know, you 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 kind of framed it really well. I mean, this um, one of the things I love about Square Pusher is, um, I mean, coming from a classical place that I've come from. There's so much orchestral music, so much textural music uh, in my in my blood, and when I hear variety and someone kind of really step into all these different worlds. That's that that kind of captures my my interest. One one dimensional records are also great. You know, if you take an, an electronic artist who's basically you know throw, throwing beats at you and all you know kind of the whole way through, that's awesome too. But the thing about Square Pusher is uh, is the diversity in mood. I mean, you've got a ballad on this. You've you know you've you, you've got uh, oh my fucking sound. I mean my you know talk about a favorite track, right? That's this like you know a huge long form tone poem, you know, like a la Richard Strauss, but different. You know, it's it's a it's a real. I, I I would I would say that that if I were introducing somebody to this particular record, it's like you know. Feels like tipping, dipping the toe in, you know, in a in a very very weird way, where there's all these different influences kind of coming, coming to play, and every track is different. You cannot expect anything from one track to another, and I love that in a record, where where you don't know wh- when you go to the second track, you, you can be completely surprised, or the third track, or the fourth track, and it's and it, it's really quite different. And there's plenty of avant-garde in here too. There's there, there's plenty of stuff that's just like not normal. I like not normal. I like not normal a lot. So that's 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 kind of what what I would what I would say about this record. You should know, and I should say in in full transparency, I did not come to Square Pusher in 2001. Uh, I came to Square Pusher much much later, and uh, and and Richard James too, and you know. Uh, it, my, my journey into electronica happened later, and part of it happened because of Andre Lafaz, to tell you the truth. Uh, because, of, because Andre's style, which I really, really uh, felt very warm to very quickly, was this kind of turntablist aesthetic, you know, where he was playing a, a guitar, but he might as well be scratching a record. Things change on a dime at the 16th note, at the 32nd note. That's square pusher the same thing. So I came very much later and my first concert wasn't until 2012. So uh, so so Go Plastic came came, you know, much later than it did for all of you when you might have been listening to it in real time. That's great. That's great. I love that you touched on uh, the the diversity. I love that too when when you you listen to records and 
you're like, wow, really? That's the, okay. That's the, because you're right. He's got some earlier records that are kind of in that, as I always say, early '70s Miles Davis kind of modal jazz thing, and then he's got some that are a little different. But this one jumps all around. I want to take this question to to Wizard, who I will say also, and we're gonna put. Uh, we've got some of her links up. We've got some everyone's links coming up. But one of the wonderful things uh, on on her records too is. Wow, you know, you get up to check sometimes. You're like, wait, is that okay? It's the same record because she also jumps all around um, in a, in a, in a positive way. Wiz, give us your thoughts on that. And if you ran into a stranger tomorrow and they and they they had no idea, how would you present both Square Pusher and this record? Um, well, Todd, I know you were talking about you coming to Square Pusher late. I just heard this album like three days ago. <laughs> Um, so I'm still like, uh, I'm still processing it. I definitely, um, yeah, can appreciate, I think like, um, the, and then I'm trying to think about like when it originally came out, I probably would have been in my like early teens, I think. Um, and I think I was more like, let's see. So it's <laughs> I'm like a little on the spot. Um, but I, I think the first impressions that I, I I definitely agree that it feels like very diverse and like eclectic in terms of tone I like I really appreciate those songs that are really like busy and kind of beboppy with the percussion just like <laughs> like really like scattered and um, high energy um, but also I do I do appreciate that kind of mix of um, noisy and abstract elements but then like a place um, more like um, familiar I guess like rhythmic structure so there's like I know there's like there's like some songs that I heard that were like more ambient and then some songs that were more like felt like I could be grounded in like um like a more I guess like traditional like rhythm structures um so I I really appreciate that that mix a lot sometimes if um things are very abstract it, it's hard for me to find a place to um enter into it or um sometimes I, I find that I, I feel a little bit like distrustful if things are abstract like um maybe like depending on who the, the artist is or like the way that I interpret the identity of the artist like it'll feel like maybe more um like I'll be like like is I'll like have questions about it like how masturbatory it is versus like how much I need to be like <laughs> you know like witness to that which is like um <laughs> so yeah I, I, that's it's again this is kind of my my kind of quick take on my as I'm newly introduced to this album but that's like some of the stuff that stood out to me that's that's great yeah and that's a great snapshot and um the um i love i love your honesty too in, in your work and, and that's how, how you present yourself on insta is great and that's such a great honest quick take and as you said you, you knew you knew about square pusher and you you knew some stuff in the past but as you said when we started talking about this you said yeah that's a new record for me so that that's very honest i love the part too of of the show offy masturbatory balance in music i know that's like a thing that especially uh in the weird music world and the progressive rock art rock you get a lot of that like here's that moment and i think that's what's interesting about this guy is that he's got this virtuoso bass thing happening he's got all this stuff yet it doesn't feel like that it feels like he's figuring it out with us and kind of you know so that's a great that's a great uh you know point to bring up um and we're going to go back to some of the earlier stuff we all listened to so i want you to tie that into the other uh, early music Let's go to Andre LaFosse, and, and let me preface by saying, you know, um, I, I I heard this man play, and like I said, we, we did a couple of shows together, God, like 20 years ago, yeah. in, in a tiny little weird place in New York on the 10th floor, somewhere like a, a studio. It was awesome. Right. But, um, you know, listened to his music for years, and then one day, I'm, I'm watching a video or something, and he is doing a solo guitar looping version of red hot car i couldn't believe it i i was like no you're not and, and because of time constraints and some technical stuff um we we didn't get to do that tonight but maybe on a future stream so um but but as uh as, as todd said you know that like pixelated fast moving 30 second note kind of world uh that you conjure up uh, makes makes me think of him sometimes. So, um, take take 
take that and run with it then and, and tell us, uh, one of your students or a stranger on the bus, how would you describe Square Pusher and this album? I guess, you know, for, for me in kind of getting ready for today and thinking about, you know, kind of what he's meant to me as a musician and a listener, I guess I kind of feel like my overall take on him is that he's kind of this person who's done very kind of consistent, intense research and development on all the different kinds of relationships that a human being can have with music technology. You know, because there's some stuff that's completely beat driven and that doesn't sound like he's doing any live bass. Uh, and it just sounds all programmed. And then the flip side is that sometimes he'll do a solo electric bass piece. Um, but most of this stuff is somewhere in between. And I think for me, um, that's been really inspi inspiring just because I think for a lot of musicians who are, are kind of more formally trained as instrumentalists and, you know, who are kind of discovering that particular corner of, of music, you know, the, the more kind of beat driven IDM type of thing. I know for me when I was discovering it, you know, I kind of had these two different impulses. One was that I really liked it, but I was also like, well, how as a guitarist, how do I kind of work my way into that? You know, how do I find a way of accessing that stuff and, and trying to access that vocabulary and speak that vocabulary a, a bit without having to just like put the guitar aside and say, okay, I have to restart from scratch. Um, and I mean, I, I actually started playing guitar because I was making synth and drum machine stuff on my four tracks. So it's not that I was a stranger to electronic music as such, but that particular way of making it, you know, just the stuff that's so through composed um, and just so, you, you know, I, it's like it's like hearing a jazz drummer play or something like, like Wizard said, you know, it's like, if you listen closely, you, and you don't even have to listen that closely, you know, it's not just cut and pasted stuff, you know, it's, it's meticulously put together. And, and one of the things that really kind of struck me was that when I would try and program drums or something like that, I always wanted it to sound very real. You know, and my, my standard was kind of like, okay, I want this to sound like a real human rhythm section. Um, and the thing that struck me about his stuff was that on the one hand, it was incredibly musical uh, and had all kinds of diversity happening. But on the other hand, you were always very aware that you were listening to electronics. You were never under the impression that you were actually hearing a human being behind an acoustic drum set. Um, and, you know, just the idea of dealing with, dealing with the stuff on its own term, you know, just reveling in, you know, reveling in, for lack of a better word, the artificiality of it, you know, just taking the, that electronic assembled thing and flaunting that and saying, no, we're not going to try and hide that. We're going to embrace that. And we're going to have that be part of the overall aesthetic. That, that for me was really inspiring. Um, I had a weird relationship with this album because I, I had been listening to him for, for a while when it came out. I think I discovered him in 97. And I wasn't crazy about Go Plastic. Um, I liked it. There was a lot I liked, but I also kind of felt like it was just this big monolithic behemoth that, you know, kind of felt like I, I had to like, you know, kind of go to battle with to listen to in a way. Um, and for whatever reason, I just found it harder to get inside that album than I did on some of his other stuff. I don't know if that's because there wasn't as much live bass playing or if it was just, you know, more, more relentless or, you know, I do think that's probably as abstracted as he had ever gotten and the most consistently abstracted. I mean, there are beats on the album for sure, but there's also an awful lot of just atomizing the stuff into sound design. Um, and I know when I first, when that album came out, I really wanted to hear beats you know, in music in general and, and in his stuff. And part of the appeal of that stuff was that it could walk that line between being incredibly funky, but also incredibly abstract. And so for me at the time, Go Plastic just felt like a little more than I could deal with at the time. Um, as I'm listening to it now, I like it, you know, uh, it sounds really good. And I think part of it also is just dealing with it in, in small bits, not feeling like I have to sit down and listen to the entire thing top to bottom, but just, you know, for me, one or two songs at a time, uh, seems a, an easier way of kind of wrapping my head around what's going on there. That's great. And that speaks to the whole endless debate on singles and albums. And I love albums, but I also love just two songs sometimes. So that's great. I'm glad you said that. Wow. You know, if, if I was that stranger and the three of y'all had said, okay, what a picture that paints. I mean, I, I would want to hear this album right away because there's a lot of mystery in, in what you all three said. There's a lot of like, wait, what? you know, let me go find out, you know, and, and that's, I think that's a great opening snapshot. Um, as I said, uh, uh, and thank you for folks uh, dialing in and let me say hello and make sure there's 
No questions. Hey, Sharon. Hey, Derek. Keith, how are you? Nick's here. Scott Robinson. Lots of excited people. We got, and again, folks, please, one of the main reasons I'm doing this, as I, as I keep saying, it, it's just a way to, to, to meet some new folks and, and hang with some folks that I haven't hung with in a while or even ever and, and talk about music, talk about what we all do as artists. So please follow up on that. And in the chat, we've got everyone's uh, band camp and their official websites so you can follow up and, and see what they do. Um, uh, War, War, Boss, War Boss Worm is saying, when I first heard the jackhammer broken hard drive part of Greenways, I had no clue what was going on. I loved it. <laughs> That's right. The, the shit was just crazy. Um, uh, let me frame a little bit of, the, um, of where this music is, both for people who are you know, um, longtime students of electronic music, but some of you who may be Watsons that are new to it. Um, and again, I, framed it by, uh, 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 I keep framing it by saying that uh, Square Pusher's first record, ironically, just hit 25 and his label, I think it's still Warp, they just did a 25th anniversary of Feed Me Weird Things. So that's like sub sub supplemental stuff you can do is go check that out. Incredible record also, but very different to this. Um, but it's important to know that this man didn't come out of nowhere. Like Andre pointed out, he kind of studied a lot of what was happening, obviously. And I think that's what's really cool when you um, hear interviews with him or, or, or he presents... Um, <clears throat> stuff on, on, on his manifestos. Very open, you know, about his process, which is also interesting as an artist. And, and I, I also selected the three of y'all because you're all very open as, as artists, which I really appreciate. But for those of you new to this sound, new to this type of music, and I'll play a little bit of him, please know that there's a lot of artists, like whether it's 808 State or Africa Mabata, LFO is a big one that, that – the, the, the group LFO with the track LFO is something that Square Pusher says that was it. That took him from being like the fusion, nerdy, masturbatory, <laughs> Jaco Pastorius direction into, wait a minute, what's going on in electronic music? But all of this stuff, Autecker, Aphex Twin, Talvin Singh, um, you know, I, I want people to know that what's great is this album kind of has a straight line of all these different things. You know, Tricky and Matmos and Bjork and all kinds of cool stuff. So, uh, again, I think it's a record that sits in the middle of all this. Um, I want to go to, on that note, with some audio. And we always mess with the copyright thing here. But I think if I talk over it a bit, <laughs> the algorithm lets it go by. So, um, play a little bit of LFO here. And, um, just to give a perspective... Um, so this is a track that, that Tom, Tom Jenkinson, he says in interviews, he was at a, a party or a friend's place or whatever. And this is it. This is the track in LFO, great group, you know, uh, 90s, kind of in that mix of dance-oriented electronics. Clearly, you know, nothing amazing about that technologically or idea-wise. I mean, that came on the the heels of the whole 80s with New Order, Depeche Mode, and a million other great, great groups, Chemical Brothers early on. Um, but I think it's cool that, that, you know, that dance electronic thing got picked up. I wanted to play another track here that um, I think people might be surprised. I'm just going to hit go. and <laughs> And if I talk over it... YouTube cares a little less, but you can hear pretty frantic drums. So that's a weird one, and um, some of y'all might know that. That's Frank Zappa from, like, 85. And I go back and I go, wow, another area where Frank Zappa was just way ahead. I mean, can you believe that? That's 85. I, you know, that's 
you know, if you played that for, for someone, they might think, you know, it's a couple years old. But but that's another cool thread I wanted to throw in there because um, – um, this guy has said he's into Zappa also, Tom Jenkinson, which um, uh, I'd love to hear, hear if he knows that part of Zappa. But all of this, um, I think everyone touched on the diversity thing a little bit uh, of the influences, which, which I think we could just do an hour just on where the music comes from, which is, of course, we won't do. Um, I wanted to um, talk a little bit about uh, technology because we all here use different technology. And um, over to you, Todd, um, classically trained. You know, you, you came out of a, a different music world, and then technology came along. Give me a snapshot of how your workflow has changed these past 20 years. Like, what? give us two or three major things that you say, wow, these are tools I didn't have 20 years ago. Well, I guess that probably the, the start would be in 19 uh let's see 1990 to 92 i was kind of given the keys to the kingdom in terms of having a key to the to the new computer music studio where i was going to school for my master's degree suny at stony brook and um in that in that time that that was kind of when i really first started to explore i got a grant of like 7500 bucks to buy gear which was amazing and that was the first time that I learned how to improvise by like playing into a digital delay and a big, huge reverb, you know. So, so that was kind of where I started in terms of electronic music. And even at that time, though, you know, in that computer music studio, sitting there with an SE30 and two floppy disks with studio, you know, opcode studio vision, uh, that, that, was, that was kind of my, my first thing. My, my best friend, Mike Lone Stern, who also has an incredible uh, YouTube presence under ear spasm. Um, he, you know, we kind of worked together till four o'clock in the morning, but I knew then that someday this stuff would all have to be in some sort of small laptop thing. And I just waited and waited and waited and waited. And when the laptop generation came along and I entered Ableton's world at, at live 2.0. So, you know, the, the very idea that I have this ability, number one, to uh, to make music and compose music in real time, kind of in a heartbeat, with no effort at all. The barrier to entry is so low with Ableton. I, I can't say enough about that program. And then also, uh, at the time I was buying hardware, I, I bought the same hardware that, uh, that Andre uses. And this was all from that Looper's Delight mailing list and discovering what was available. I had a jam man, but then I discovered the Oberheim Echoplex. Oh my God. And then I had two of them. And, you know, uh, so, so, you know, basically that changed my life. It, you know, the whole idea of composition was daunting to me because as a classical musician, you come up, first of all, with the likes of Beethoven, who was, you know, rumored to be kind of a jerk. But other than that, you know, spectacular, large scale form music. And then you go into the 20th century and you got all these other folks who are writing this mathematically intense music. That's kind of what I performed. That's what I gravitated toward. Finally came, came on to uh, Steve Reich, without whom techno might not be as interesting. I'm not sure. You know, I think he had a, he had a pretty pretty profound uh, influence on uh, on electronic music just in terms of, of form and substance and uh, so so those those are the things that that occur to me you know the the progression of the hardware to be able to record audio in real time that's how I learned to make music because I because a blank piece of score paper scared the devil out of me but an empty looper doesn't because I get to put in a note, have it come back, play along. So that's how I learned to write music or improvise music. And that's how I learned to make the music that I would later go on to call my music. So that's the seminal thing. Laptops, hardware loopers, Steve Reich, and the colleagues that I met along the way, like you all. Can't hear you right this minute. I think you're still muted, my friend. Thank you. <laughs> uh, so um, the computer and the looper. I mean, that, that sounds like, wow, that's a one-two punch. And yeah, you know, you have music before that and after that. Uh, that that's, 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 a good, that's a great one. Um, Wizard, how about, how about your, 
you're you're a lot younger than than all of us, <laughs> so you know it, it, that's what's interesting too. Getting that perspective from a younger person, um, but listening to your music again, there's, there's drum machines, there's so hardware. I, I see you using tablets and phones and uh, uh, drumsticks with you know I, I love it there's nothing that's not on the table so um that's my outsider kind of fascination with this you tell us what um what what's been as an artist uh the biggest kind of changing um things that came into your toolbox this this last you know 15 20 years mm-hmm. um 15 to Probably, I mean, I definitely am drawn towards like, I'm not trained and I also am just like, whatever I can grab and make things fastest with, like I'm really drawn to like the least amount of learning curve. (laughs) Um, So definitely like I've been using GarageBand for a really long time, like and either like getting shit for it or like or people just being like oh i'm really shocked that that's garage band which is funny to me because it's i mean at it's it's also like you just using a synthesizer like there's it's uh i think there's maybe maybe there's like less features or like maybe there's less control over the sounds that you than you would have on like um some of the like maybe more like advanced or complex like software but um i'm really drawn to it just again because of like the accessibility and simplicity of like just being able to get in and write songs um i also use nano loop a lot on my iphone which was um originally like a game boy console for making like um game boy music um and i also really like that because it's a very it's pretty restrictive um and i think that that really helps to helps me to to write songs um yeah, I think maybe that's my answer. My answer to that. Okay, um, that's great. Nano Loop. I wrote it down. I always take some notes, and I, I've been loving. Um, uh, Andre's been reviewing all these amazing new loopers, so I'm feverishly writing them all down. <laughs> I, I I gotta I I I agree. GarageBand. You know, I still use it. I I use Ableton. I use Mainstage. I use a little bit of Logic, but what's wrong with garage bit <laughs> it's great you know and then and as time has gone on you're right there's this there's this mix of of um over the years a lot more respect has come to garage but there's this mix of people going really that's what you use is that uh, while they just said that your shit sounded really good so you have this <laughs> you know and um but there's hit albums that I, I forget who it was but somebody uh i was watching the grammys like a year ago and, and somewhere in there she said oh i use garage band so all kinds of bands and, and, and artists and, and recording live albums right onto their computers. Um, Garage Band is great. Um, and, and looping. Okay, so that's, that's, your, that's your, your looper of choice, the nano, nano loop. Okay. Um, I wonder, I guess I don't know categories of devices very much. Um, yeah, I guess it is like a sequ- sequencer. Okay. And a, would a sequencer and a looper be the same? They overlap greatly, yeah. So, uh, and I'm sure in software, there's there's someone you know um, blurring that line. Yeah, I know. I I was just watching a video earlier of, of Andre again demoing the Lupe, which to me kind of has some sequencer things that it does. You know, letting you restart and stuff like that. Um, uh, uh, over to you, Andre, on gear. Then, like, what? Give us, uh, you know, like two highlights in the past twenty years where you. You've really changed the toolbox. Um, live looping, Echoplex Digital Pro, which literally changed my life. Um, and I'm, I'm kind of cheating by saying that because I actually got my Echoplex in 95, so it's more like 26 years now, which is horrifying to realize, let alone to, to say out loud. Um, but, you know, it just, it, it, it did seem, and I guess it continues to seem like the most organic way of kind of bridging those worlds between wanting to be an instrumentalist on the one hand, but also really loving electronic music on the other and trying to figure out how those two aspects can coexist. And, you know, if you're, if you're doing live looping and if you're doing the approach that we tend to, where it's, you know, you're an instrumentalist, you play into the looper, it comes back, then, you know, you are literally the, the material, you know, the, the sound is literally coming from you, um, which to me is about as hands-on as you can get. I mean, it's, you know, it's a different sort of thing than if you're like, you know, turning an oscillator tuner or, or working with hardware or something like that. I mean, that's, that's very 
you know, very direct and very hands-on as well. But for me, actually knowing that you're creating the, the sound with your bare hands and then manipulating it in real time, that's, that did and still does have a real fascination for me. Um, so that's been the main thing. Beyond that, it's, you know, I remember it was actually 20 years ago this year that I started recording audio on a computer. Because um, I started it off with a four-track cassette recorder in the late 80s. Um, and then I used an eight-track recorder at college. Um, and then I had a standalone hard disk recorder, a VS-880. Uh, and then finally in 01, I got a computer that was powerful enough to run digital audio. Um, and I remember also around that time, like I was starting to hear about this new program called Ableton Live. Um, and I was also hearing about this new program called Napster. Uh, so, you know, I think a lot of what's happened also to, for me and, and just in general over the last 20 years has just been this, this seismic shift in accessibility, both in terms of the tools to make the stuff and in terms of ways to hear the stuff as, as listeners. Um, and I think it's had a, a ton of really positive stuff, you know, in, inevitably there are always going to be advantages and disadvantages to all this stuff. Um, but just, you know, the, the leveling of the playing field, I think, is, is what comes to mind the most if I think about the last 20 years in, in music technology. That's great. Yes, the leveling is a big one for me. And, and um, uh, the, the whole movement, actually, of Warp Records and Aphex Twin and all the amazing artists that are on that has really um, democratized it, you know, when I read about how that record company runs um, <clears throat> after decades of shitty record companies. Um, let's see if there's any questions. Put And if you got any questions, folks, put them in there. Ego Plum says, check out the baseline generator from Raymond Scott. Wow. Oh. Yeah, you know, um, yeah, yeah, I yeah. Love, love Raymond Scott. You know that track, baseline yeah. generator? Yeah. yeah. Um, I'm bad on his track titles, but I, I'm sure I've heard it. Because many times I've been listening to Raymond Scott and I've said, how is this 1960, you know? Uh, yeah, baseline songs? generator could be on a warp record and it would it's sound completely at home. Crazy. And he, yeah. um, he built some of the first sequencers and, and, and he had an employee, which I always remind people, he had a teenager working for him doing soldering and stuff. A young man named Robert Moog. So <laughs> that, that's who worked for Raymond Scott. So good point there. Um, Someone says, uh, Keith says, the personal journey in relationships seems like we almost explore with regards to technology. Yeah. He famously eschewed a computer. Well, you know, he used um, one of those early computers. Um, uh, I forget. Uh, Commodore. He used a Commodore VIC, a VIC-20. So he used computers early on. And um, I think, yeah, one of the first tr tracks he did was drum machines from, from this computer. So, you know, y you have that. Um I wanted to go back to just a, a snippet or two of music. Um, this one is always just a cool um, track, Exploding Psychology, because it really gets into the drill, drum and bass sort of thing, but also some ambience. So let's listen for a second. <laughs> We better start talking over this, Andre. Yes, right. Yes. You're right. I didn't want to let you play it too much. It's so good. I gotta find out what the actual rules are. Ten seconds. But. Pause there, but the that kind of broken video game kind of thing too. I just love that that he kind of finds the, the. There's a sense of humor, that, you know, oh, about yeah. this. You know, there's the serious art thing which we've touched on. That again, all three of y'all have a real lot of fun and humor in what you're doing. But I love that he does that. And um, uh, I, I read an interview with, uh, or saw an interview with Andre Three Thousand once who describes Square Pusher as, I'm going to get this a little wrong, but he basically said, sounds like a computer throwing up, <laughs> which I thought was great. Because, yeah, it just sounds like all this shit's being processed. But that that blend of, of going into ambient moments and, and 
going into beat driven moments is is always exciting to me. I want to play a little bit of each of your music, but I wanted to start with something from uh, from Wizard, and this is and we have um, Wizard's um, Bandcamp. We have linked, and as I always encourage people. You know, this is your way to support an artist directly. Not only finding out what they're about, what they're doing on their websites, um, but um, support them directly. Go in there and, and, and you know you're buying something directly from the artist. Um, <clears throat> so I'm going to play something from, I believe, is, is Rash of Feathers your first album? Um, no, I, I, I Most of them have been like self-released so there's a couple before that um okay but it's it's if it's the first year here <laughs> that's yeah, yeah. Enough. <laughs> it's it's um you know um I, I don't know how complete the band camp is there's a few records on there but that's one of the older ones but i just want to play a little bit of a track here <laughs> to play that one because you know for someone your age too it, it's great because this sounds like what i grew up with in the 80s it's like that cool kind of prophet synth kind of vibe and then this you know beautiful melody happening mm -hmm. just just a nice song but then the same human being has Two tracks that are just different sides of, of you know, the many uh, things that you drop. Talk to us a little bit about, um, uh, well, let me quote you a little bit. I saw on your Insta the other day, you did a really cool um, kind of like, this is who I am. And, and excuse me if I missed some of these, but you said uh, something along the lines that in your art, you've got, um, you're dealing with um psychology and the psychology of being a black woman and mm -hmm. colonialism and racism and gender discrimination and edibles <laughs> i love that edibles <laughs> are in there and i and then you said a great word you said you said i'm very developmenty in my music i i'm i'm just i'm going through this development i'm going through this journey i'm asking all these questions and i'm doing it uh openly with art um is that a fair quote from from what i saw the other day and and take us a little bit into more detail on that how you approach just today hit and record talk about yeah. that yeah that sounds like a accurate <laughs> synopsis um i think that 
like I was saying earlier that um, I'm like less attracted or I, I like to to write as fast as I can or um, I'm less interested I think in like gear and probably um, te- like um, uh, yeah I guess I'm just like I, a lot of my reason for making music has been to kind of um, like affirm my own reality um and i think that for you know various types of marginalized people like just being i'm like someone who's like so obsessed with my interiority because there are so many kind of forces outside of myself projecting identity and experience onto me so like music is often a way for me to be very anchored in my own reality my own like emotional reality and psychic reality and psychological reality and so like i i think like i mean that that the clips that you played were from 2013 and so kind of just naturally because of writing songs for so long that the my technical skill has improved as well but i also it's not as big of a priority, I guess, as um, trying to figure out how to like accurately translate something that I'm experiencing, I guess, internally, or like trying to find some way to represent it, which I think a lot of musicians feel that way. Um, and for me, it's like the, I guess, like the main, the main reason. That's yeah. That, that's as honest as it gets. Just trying to find some some way to to find ourselves no that that's i love that you you, on your insta you just really put that out there you say i'm 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 not having a great day i'm not you know i I really that is so empowering as an artist um and and that vulnerability i think again is what what i'm inspired by by all three of y'all um over to todd who, who todd you also that you know that segues nicely i mean i love that you get on there and you say that too you say yeah having a shitty day here or the, you know long day or this isn't working out and then you'll just improvise or you, you'll present some music um us let, let's start out with listening to a little bit of todd um this is also a couple years ago but i think it's a great little moment when he, he did a ted talk so let's hear that oh god <laughs> So okay, yeah, just a little a little bite there of just but one little side of, of Todd's thing where he's alone with a, a looper and, and some electronics. Um, you know, uh, talk about that creative area too, because um, uh, I think what, what Wizards touched on a couple of times, which I think all of us have talked about, is to not get caught up in the gear. And, and the gear is interesting, but it's just there. It's like. You know, and, and I noticed, Todd, in all your different uh, scenarios through the years, it's different stuff you're using, but it doesn't really matter. Talk to us about that when when you get up in the morning and, and it's like, okay, um, creative time. Um, talk to us just a little bit about, you know, uh, how that goes for you. You know, that balance of thinking about the technology and the buttons and the idea, idea the um, versus the musical ideas. One of the things that um, that has always made a big impression on me is when I watch people make music and it looks like they're brushing their teeth. That it looks like it's really natural for them. And we all play instruments. We all have our, have our, 
have our thing, you know, or our things, or maybe somebody's thing is constantly a different instrument every day. Percussionists are like that all the time. It's like, I don't play the, the vibes. I play everything. And, um, and it's, it's more the, it's more the comfort, you know, with, with the instrument and the use for self-expression. Uh, what, what wizard said really resonated with me, you know, um, as a classical musician, we train, we train like gymnasts. We train like like Olympic musicians, uh, um, Olympic musicians. Did I just say that? Like Olympic <laughs> athletes. Works. We train, you know. And also, there's a there's an incredible amount of of elitism that can come with that training as well. And one of the things that I found in my in my moving forward with technology and with looping and with music and with composing, is if there's one thing that held me back the most. It was a pursuit of perfectionism. And so it really heartens me when I see somebody of a younger generation like like Wizard, and I see this so many times, he does more and more and more, and it, it so encourages me that people are, are seeking to express themselves and define their reality with their music. It's a way of speaking and talking that I don't have, having come up the way I came up. So... So there is this seeking that I have of having the tools be the tools. You know, I've gotten to a point where I know what's going to go wrong. If there's something to go, there are a lot of people who are really scared of technology. Boy, I'm the farthest thing from that. And if something goes wrong, I could care less and let me vamp with the audience and establish a connection because that's more fun than playing anyway. And so, uh, so, so the technology is not, is simply a tool. It might as well be my violin but I'd rather it be all these other things so that then I get to make music and make a larger piece than I possibly could with my violin. That, that's my choice. And as far as you know, how, how I then intersect with Wizard is that whenever my, my preferred way of being and my happy place is really, is really about being in front of an audience with no idea what I'm gonna do at all, not caring, what I'm going to do at all and simply starting with one note and composing with with one note and the tools help me to do that there's no way I could do that with with just a violin so that's my that's my journey and when I do it right or when I do it you know it's all about how I feel inside of it and when I can drop down and then after it's all done and over I kind of forget what I did forget what I played that's a good day so my, 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 my best creative day is when I lose myself uh, in, in doing what I'm doing um, and the walls go away. You're muted. <clears throat> uh, Got to remember to unmute. I usually don't mute. Yeah, I'm doing it today to keep the noise down. Um, I love um, start with one note. Yeah, that you know, that's that's what we got to do, and 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 again, that the, uh, some some of the themes tonight are great. Democratization, you know, just uh, uh, keeping it simple and turning off that left brain shit of like, you know, oh, you know, there's, you know, the there's there's a bump right around 10k, and I've got to eat, you know, just do some music, you know, and and I love that again from all three of y'all when I listen to tracks, I I, I don't think about the technical stuff unless unless i make myself go there you know it just it just happens as music um a, a quick little soundbite of mr lafosse that we're going to look at um this is a strange one but here we go that is a strange one sounds great though andre awesome <laughs> it was a very naturalistic approach you know <laughs> You talk about getting out of the way of the music. <laughs> Dude. And then the music gets out of the way of you. We're totally vamping for you, Andre. Um, can you hear it now? No, we can't yet. Oh, shit. I see it. I Here see it, too. It's not with us quite yet. Um, I don't know why. should be on um, how so about now? this is all open string right now 
There we go. And if I Got fret it. a note, I'm going to play the tenth fret. Different points. Other type of harmonic I do a lot. Where's too far either way. That sort of thing. The harmonic, and then if I actually fret that, twelve frets higher, and play with the same technique with the right hand. It's a meatier, more defined sound. A lot of variations as far as oh, body have, type. I, 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 I got bad. screwed up by my audio there. I had a beautiful. But it doesn't have the same section. There we go. There we go. I'm going to press the replace button with my left hand off camera. There we go. So my clever uh, attempt was to just play that little middle part, um, and I, I screwed myself up technically. But I thought that that little section was cool because it ties in again to this sound that that brought us together. Um, that that just a a rhythmic kind of broken machine type stuff that that Square Push is so good at. Um, uh, uh, so same question to you, Andre. I mean, obviously. You 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 do a lot of um, uh, I'm I'm always nervous of the word creating content because it sounds like we're, we're we're making hot dogs in a factory but but you 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 do a lot of videos around the idea of of building this voice this this looping technology and you do some stuff like that that's kind of more teaching um, talk to me a little bit about again when you when you're just in creative mode non teaching mode. Um, t talk to us a little bit about how that feels when you just turn it all off and, and put something down. Yeah, you know, it's interesting because we're talking about combinations of gear and that kind of thing. And, and what I've found is that I seem to do the work that I enjoy the most and that feels the best when I'm doing it and that I also like the most after the fact as I'm listening to it. My best work, I feel like, comes from finding a set of parameters or a set of limitations that I can work in. Um, and, and part of that is, I think, just the act of learning to play an instrument, you know, not even talking about a laptop or, or a synthesizer, but just the act of learning to play an acoustic instrument. To me, you could kind of describe that as being basically the process of learning to work within limitations, I feel like, you know, and most of my guitar students are beginners, so I see this every time I teach. Uh, you know, just people getting used to the basic idea of how you fret a note or how you play an open chord or that kind of thing. Um, and to me, whether you're talking about playing a guitar or a laptop or a looping device or anything else, it's about kind of finding a set of parameters that you can work within, you know, and I think, I think all of us can probably relate to the idea that if you have too many options available, then in a lot of cases it becomes hard to do anything. You know, because it's very easy to get option anxiety, especially when option there's, anxiety. Yeah. Especially, you know, especially when there's so much great freeware available. You know, at this point, you know, you could you could make people do make great recordings without having to buy any commercial software. Um, so, you know, having too many options can be can be an issue. But you know, like Todd was also saying, there are certain things that he wants to do that he can't do with just a violin by itself. You know, so for me, I think it's it's about trying to find parameters and sets of, of circumstances that I find inspiring to work with. Um, sometimes that's just playing guitar, sometimes it's firing up a live looper, sometimes it's just not even touching a guitar and playing around with sound design or synthesizers on my computer. Um, it depends, you know, but, but the, the stuff that I seem to gravitate towards is the stuff that I have a lot of familiarity with on the one hand, but I also, it, it, it narrows the focus enough so that I don't have an endless array of possibilities. You know, it's like there's some stuff that I know I can do. There's other stuff that is completely off the table, whether it's because of limitations of the gear or limitations of myself as a player. 
Um, and that's good. You know, I think, I think we have to kind of find limitations to work within in order to develop facility with something. Okay. Yeah. Limitations. I love cause yeah, you know, it forces you to, um, I'm not muted, right? Yeah. It forces you to just say, okay, I just have these couple, um, bits in the toolbox. So uh, that's a great, that's a great point. Um, this is great because from each person, we got like two or three really cool things that, that I think are, are teachable for um, creative people watching this. Um, going to touch base on, on the record again in, in a minute. Um, and again, that it's just a starting point kind of for a discussion here. As I said, we're not going to – we never were going to just sit there and go uh, track by track because YouTube would not allow it. But uh, let's see if there's any questions here, folks. And, and we got we got about another 15 minutes, but thank you for – for being here, um, Tasso Sheet Music, uh, okay. Um, oh, okay, needed to have some more volume. Okay, I'll do that next time. Um, um, okay, cool. I wanted to jump um, to, to talk a little bit about other electronic influences and um, wanted to go to a, a more recent video from Wizard. I believe this is, correct me if I'm wrong, again, all of y'all, but Wizard, this is... Um, the exorcism video is this it's dated about a year ago about about 14 months ago is that accurate mm -hmm. that's accurate okay um so let's take a quick sound bite of that someone who likes me how long do i have before i hurt her how long before her love makes me resentful mm, she's so unsuspecting i think she really likes me i find her willingness useful but disgusting how long do i have before she sees me i hope she doesn't leave me Just um, what a sense of foreboding and <laughs> what a dark, dark track. And again, just I, I love that you just talk about um, ex exercising. What a great title. Just getting this stuff out. Um, um, f the other thing I want to say is, um, can we be in your band? Because <laughs> that 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 uh, we should form a band here. This is because, you know, the, the, the cello and the, the different textures that are all in there. It, it's uh, so overlaps with with the interests of of, of all y'all, so that, it's great. But but I think, um, folks, as Wizard, uh, I want to towards the the closing part of this, find out what everyone's doing next. And Wizard, um, I know you tour a lot, and uh, people should go down the rabbit hole, find some videos, because as I said, it, it's the most recent show that we've seen. We saw her play March fifth or eighth or something, twenty twenty. And it was funny. It was this really cool avant-garde venue here in town, Revolve. And the guy had uh, uh, Purell. And he kind of, he was saying all this stuff about, you know, open your own water and put stuff here. And we're going, what? We're, y you mean that thing that it, 
over in the Middle East, uh, over in China? Really? You know, we hadn't yet experienced it yet in the U.S., so, so, so her show was kind of the final one. But it, we talked about it for months because it was so dramatic, and I want people to go find if they can. And, Wizard, you can... When I shut up, you can. And that's part of the question I have: is 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 there a video um, that you would point people to to a complete show? Because she had projections, she had photographs going, she had stuff hung up, she had lighting. I think she had four or five different types of lights that she brought in, she turned on and off. And I really was struck by, uh, as she's touched on a bunch of times, using these really simple ideas and and coming up with something dramatic even that little video had such a a film noir kind of thing going on uh, um you know very very um basic but very dramatic talk to us a little bit about um uh, first that part what you consider like the best place for people to find out about you and what do you have planned for the next say four to six months is if anything um, yeah, thank you so much. Thanks for it was really yeah, that's how we met was uh, during that show where I was on my way back to California, because the pandemic had really just like started to people were like understanding how the risk associated with it and stuff like that. So um, yeah, really special introduction. Um, the best place to check out my work is Instagram, which is just wizard apprentice because um, that's where I spend most of my time on social media and it's also the place where you can find links to other um like my website or like other um, social media platforms that i'm on um and then was there another question oh there is a full performance of that the performance that i did live which is for my album dig a pit um which um was released yeah last year or the year before my sense of time is funny I know, um, right? But, uh, yeah, you know, so it's add a year, time. just add a year. Yeah. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, I, 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 um, in the middle of the pandemic, actually went to um, San Francisco to do a um, filmed performance in the Great American Music Hall. So, um, uh, for like a live stream performance there. So I, I'll be, I'll be posting that soon. It isn't up anywhere, but if it is up, uh, the best place to find it would be Instagram. <clears throat> Okay, great. So, and, and nothing. I think you were saying before we came on the air. Nothing really on the books, right? You, you're kind of just chilling, making music at home. Yeah, I'm still like I think warming up to. I think I was one of those people who the pandemic taught me how deeply introverted I am because I was like, <laughs> oh, if this is the form of apocalypse we're dealing with, I could probably ride this out for <laughs> for for a minute. But uh, so I'm yeah, I'm easing back into being in physical space with people. <laughs> I, I love it. And, you know, I didn't think of it, but in a subtle way, it's just once once I put this together, I was like, you know, wow, these are folks that I've been wanting to talk to. And by the way, for, for viewers, we're going to do um, some separate interviews with all three of these wonderful human beings on my shows because they each have a story to tell and they have other music. But again, as I said at the top, what an excuse <laughs> to come on and just say happy birthday to the 20th anniversary of this great record. And then bounce off of there. Um, but, uh, yeah, I think it's true about uh, uh, as much as I know Andre and Todd. They're introverted, too, and they're happy to be in the studio <laughs> and creating. Uh, likewise, Wizard, I, when this happened, I was like a, a month or two, and I was like, so wait a minute. So I, I can just stay in the studio? <laughs> wait a minute. Are you serious? And, you know. And so now it's like, yeah, I put my toe in the water. I played one gig last week, and I have one Sunday, both solo, electronic, so I'm not dealing with other people in a van or an airplane. And uh, But, yeah, it's a little nerve-wracking, especially as it's not over. A lot of people are talking about, oh, that old pandemic. Remember that? And I'm going, wait, because I just read, you know, so we're still doing this. So I appreciate that, that, that you're like, yeah, I'm working at home um uh before i jump over to, to todd i wanted to um and everyone's instagram and links are up there as i said but as wizard said yeah the, the instagram is where it's at i mean you know she's on there um quite often and this it's always funny stuff it's always uh, serious stuff but it's a mix of stuff you know it, it's um just a kind of a, a a real diary of an artist um you know so 
Um, and then uh, Todd Reynolds is on there, and I, we put his link up. And, and Todd's been doing a lot of um, uh, 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 a lot of workshops, a lot of stuff around streaming, a lot of stuff around learning this new technology, and, and a lot of social social justice stuff, which you know um, we all appreciate. Um, Todd, tell us a little bit where, where you are for the next three to six months. Uh, wh- what's what's up for you? So uh, just the next month is uh, we do our, we skipped our festival. I, I'm part of a, a group called Bang on a Can, which is a collective out of New York City, a new music kind of uh, um, avant-garde classical music. It's not avant-garde even. It's just it's a very great classical music collective that has its roots in rock and roll in the present day. That's what it is. And we've been doing marathons this whole pandemic, you know, uh, just I, I don't know how many we've done now, like six of them, uh, like virtually. So we are now having our festival that we had to cancel last year. Um, so we're doing it now live. We've got 20, 20 students. So they're not students. We call them fellows. Uh, they're all young professionals. And, uh, and we play music together and, uh, and work together on realizing uh, composers' tunes. Composers come too. So that's happening in July. I have no plans to tour. I have no plans to do anything. I actually kind of like to stay home uh, these days, especially. I, I, my, my partner and my dog keep me busy. My studio keeps me busy. And, um, and right now you can probably find me streaming most of the time. I, I've kind of taken a, taken a little hiatus. But for a long time during the pandemic, I was streaming. In December, I streamed every single day. And uh, if I wanted to point somebody to some place to follow me, I would I would enjoy a YouTube follow because I, um, I I actually all my streaming stuff is on there. So you could kind of put that. I need to make a mix on there. Okay. Just, yeah. Because it's good to drive to, to sleep to, and to enjoy. <laughs> so <laughs> I would I would in, enjoy that. It's um, it's uh, it's up there on the on the upper right, and that is. Um, that's that's the whole that's the whole streaming vibe that I do some sometimes late at night, so I really enjoy uh, enjoy doing that. But yeah, streaming streaming is kind of where it's at for me rather than than the touring. Of course, you know, if somebody calls me, <laughs> it, it can happen. Yeah, it can always what, happen, right? What a so. beautiful setup, and I, I love that we've seen this grow in one year. I mean, right? a right? year ago, man, you had couple little things you had a camera and and you brought us on that journey and so it, it's it's awesome um <laughs> no and, and and you know there's no reason for us to get rid of that knowledge you know going forward the streaming thing is is you know um uh, is still it's just a new a way it's a new way to be with people it's not a new way it's an old way of being with people which yeah. has all of a sudden become more accepted and more useful yeah you know, over the past couple of years, Andre, I, I forget when you started your, your Echoplex series, Andre, but, you know, there was a time when Andre wasn't on YouTube. And now this tons and tons and tons of educational content, which is not going to stop. And uh, and and that's that's something I that's something I haven't done yet. I haven't, you know, drilled down into making content. So, you know, we all have we all have our. It's, I don't want to call it envy or coveting, but we all look to our friends, like all the people on this screen, and boy, there is plenty of stuff that I have to admire and learn <laughs> from and want, want a piece of from, yeah. from everybody here. And that's, that's, I think, the thing is in my, my later life, in the, the, you know, I'm definitely in the last half of my life because I'm like 57. But, um, but in this area of my life, one of the things that's most exciting to me is I feel differently about learning from everybody. There's all these things that I don't know that I don't know that I hear every day from somebody new that says, yeah, yeah, that's that's the way. That's fantastic. Is there something, because you said you hadn't put this record on in quite a while, Go Placid, is there something like a, 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 a reaction you had that was new because you hadn't heard it in a while? Is there something where you where you learned from it? <laughs> hearing it afresh yeah there really was um what 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 i learned from it is that is that i can i can um dig a little deeper in into into just putting some stuff together that doesn't make sense to put together 
Okay. <laughs> you know, I know you have it queued up there somewhere. That that sure. that, that 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 in studio thing of Tom, where where he where he mixed. You know, he he you know in, in the early days. Um, or, or maybe you, you don't, but if you don't know about this, it's something I will go find for you. In his, it's it's an younger, early right? interview in his studio, and it's all about mixing, you know? Right. In uh, 2000, I'm sorry, I'm getting off topic. If you don't no, mind, I'll, I'll, okay. So in 2012, what is it? Was it you, Fabulum? Is that, is that the, the, the record? That he, came, yep. he came through New York to Le Poisson Rouge, and I went. And I was like, of course, I was the guy who was trying to get toward the side so I could see what gear he was using. I was obsessed. I was like, I got to know what he's using. And so for the first 45 minutes, all he was doing, he had a, he had a novation, that, that one that doesn't have a keyboard on it. it just, it's just a mixing station. That's all he was using. He had two of them. So he wow. has all these tracks, and he's really just mixing and throwing faders up and down. Then the second half of the concert was him standing on a stage surrounded by, by like 24 volume pedals. Yeah. And they were all just going into this bank of even tight Orvilles. And there he made his whole entire second half of his set, drum and bass, with nothing but his bass. Yeah. I, I've and seen that, him break that down. I, I, oh, that was, yeah. that was amazing. But, but, sorry, to answer your question, the answer to your question is that, yeah, it's about putting stuff together. And, you know, this is the 10th anniversary of my record. Oh, which one? The Outerboro. Outerboro came out. Wow. wow, right? It's 2011. So, so there's there's this idea of of even you're bringing this up in terms of this anniversary and saying, yeah, you know, I need to go back there and look at that, even though it's kind of hard sometimes for me to listen to my own music and I don't want to focus on the old stuff so much. Yes, I, that's always. Yeah, but I want to go 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 back there, maybe break it down a little bit, and maybe ask somebody to to remix it or something, and and. And kind of just just revisiting Square Pusher in this older form today right, made it right. occur for me that you know oh there's probably some possibilities I haven't thought of to uh, to like make music anew myself in some other way. That's great. That that's a you know that's anytime there's an inspiration that's good news. Oh yeah. Um, is there a favorite track on this record for you? Oh yeah, my 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 fucking sound. My fucking sound, yeah, that is. Um, oh my know. god, I mean, um, um, yeah, it's just so, it's just so out, and so many different sounds. Yeah, and and, and the thing is that that it's the arc of it. The arc of it is very classical for yeah. me. No, that's a great, and it's one of the ones that I honestly, again, I, I was psyched when I, you know, put this together you know last week or over the weekend last week and I, and I was like this is one of those tracks that could be anyone here has some music like this you know yep. um, which I think is just this kind of floating and then sec second for me would be Red Hot Car right Ah. He's turning some knobs there. It's beautiful. It's beautiful. But yet so And that's a piano. You know, that's a that's just a piano. A hit pi a struck piano, you know, with a with a drumstick or something. Yeah, no that that's Amazing. um that that's a great choice for a track. Um before I, I let's see, I wanted to also let people know um uh, let's see if I can find it quickly enough. This is pretty cool. This is also a, um, a, a, a snapshot of um, some of the um, musical madness that Todd's been involved in. This is a piece with oh Meredith Monk. Yeah. In, in a... And you'll see Todd in a few seconds. Behind the woman with the red dress. That's a long time ago.
Beautiful. Um, again, time constraints. I wish we could sit and watch the whole 10 minutes. But that, that piece and, 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 and your side of your artistry that comes from Meredith Monk and Bang in a Can, that's why I was really happy to, to have, uh, have you meet Wizard because I, I think she's bringing in a, a, a new generation of that whole idea of the music being a lot more than just the sound, you know, the pictures, the thoughts, the lighting, everything like that. Um, w Wizard, have you, have you ever seen that Meredith Monk video? Have you encountered that? No, but I'm really excited to it's, spend more time with it. It's isn't really that cool? Yeah, I really I mean, appreciate all the music that you shared from both of these artists. Yeah. Like yeah. But, if you ever want to do even, if you ever want want to talk about another deep dive into Meredith Wizard, you, you let me know. I'm so happy that happy to share with her. She changed our classical world. It turned it upside down in its head in the 60s. It's, it's, she's amazing. Yeah, Thank and you. still still doing it. She's probably yep. about 80 now. How old is Meredith? You know what? I, I will bet you that's a sore subject, and I would not. Okay. I would. <laughs> oh, oh, hey. You know, well, you know, with artists, it's, it's rather public. You never know. <laughs> you never know, but I would never deign to guess. It, so. Well, you know, she, as you said, she was groundbreaking by 1971 or 72. Yeah. So, I, I mean, mean and, you know. and, and she um, is ageless, and of all the people on earth, she might be the one to live forever. So. You know, it, it's, it's crazy. Um uh, Wizard, uh, on that note, what's your favorite track, if you have one, on, on the record? And is there one that just jumped out? I, there was one that jumped out, but I don't remember the name of it, okay. I'm afraid. So. Sure, sure. <laughs> Sorry. But, okay, th that's okay. Just segueing um, from that, experiencing this record, um, as you said, you were, you, were, you were knowledgeable of Square Pusher and knew some of the music, but this record's new for you. As we wrap up, um, how has it affected you creatively going forward? Is there anything that you've pulled and said, wow, you know, this is, you know. I think I like the, um, like the, the spatial, like how spatial it is. So like that, I think that that's something that I think a lot of the, because I'm not very technical in my recording that most of mine ends up being like pretty flat or pretty static, which I'm, I mean, I that is a fine, as fine of a dynamic as any, but I do really like how, um, yeah, just like almost like you can see shapes when I, or like, I feel like I can like see shapes. So I think that's something that feels really inspiring about the songs that I've heard from this album. Wow. Yeah. So there's a real visual. Yeah. That's a great description. Cause I, I love uh, listening to this kind of music on headphones and yeah, especially if I've had an edible, then, then it's definitely some shapes and stuff are happening. Uh, uh, I, <laughs> um, I, and I'm in a state where we don't have the full-on edibles, Wiz. So we have we have the Delta Eight. Have you all heard of that? It's kind of the, the kind of THC. But but yeah, seeing shapes, seeing stuff move around. That that's a great. Uh, and and I love you know. Uh, you, you've pointed out a few times that you know you're not technical. You're not. But you know. <laughs> That's the best, actually, because it's that's one of the things that to me is a thesis about about um, Square Pusher is that he debunks this whole thing of the right way to do it and the right way to EQ and the, you know there's a little buzz on the you know uh, the the left side of this. I love it. I love that there's that dirt in there. And, and again, a common thing with all of y'all is that you you do leave warts and all in there. So you know keep yeah keep seeing shapes and putting them on, onto recordings my namesake west coast andre um let's close with, with your thought on that as well um what's your favorite track if you have one on go plastic uh, oh the first and last ones so you know red red hot car red hot car and is it plisto flex out I, you know i Something i go like with plisto yeah okay um and and one of the reasons I like those two is because they're they're kind of coming from opposite sides of, of the equation. You know, I feel like they're 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 both coming from beat driven place. Uh, and the first one is just atomizing the beat and the groove in every possible direction. And and then Plaid Style Flex Out is actually a very kind of straightforward thing until you get to that kind of signature baseline thing. Yeah. Yeah, and sounds yeah. like it's tricky. Uh, and yeah, like the, the main riff that kicks in in like a minute or so from here, you know, it's, I don't think you could notate that on staff paper. You know, I think mm. it's the kind of thing that, that you can't really reduce down to anything other than sound. Uh, but it's a hook. 
you know, it's like that, that kicks in and like, that's the hook of the tune and it's really catchy. You know, it's really abstract, but it's also really catchy. And also I like this track because it's such a contrast to everything we've done before. You know, it's like he's, he's setting down a groove and he's just content to sit, you know, so it's like the epilogue of the whole record. Um, and I'm not saying that I want to skip the entire record and go straight to the epilogue, but I, I like the way this track works. And I like the fact that it's yeah. unconventional in, in his canon, but sure. uh, it's still, to me, still recognizable as him. That line, that, that line. Yeah. Yeah. Now that that that's some twisted shit. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, again, the, the time limits of this format are maddening because we could we could talk about um, so many um, different layers uh, um, going forward. I'm backwards with this, um, and and. Uh, you know that that track. It's funny that that um, uh, what was it? Uh, s oh, help me out with the name. Splatter Cell, right? That our our dear pal David Torn. Um, and you could hear he loves Square Pusher, and you could hear like that last track. He kind of you know snuck some of that into into his world. Um, well, all right. I'm going to close with one more one more question, which is, tell me each of you um, two other electronic artists that that you know um are very important to you that, that go into your work that um in this vast ocean of electronics and we just touched on the tiniest area andre start with you who are two other people that you would say listeners should know that that it's part of your dna uh david torrance the first name that comes to mind you know I, i'm musically speaking i'm one of his kids as far as i'm concerned you know i wouldn't sound like i do without him um, and, you know, just such a diversity of different approaches, but it still has a recognizable stamp to it. Um, and he's, a, he's kind of a challenging guy to recommend because, you know, he doesn't always do the same kind of thing on every album, you know. So he's done so, some stuff that's very abstract and kind of avant-garde. And he's also done some, some Hollywood film scores that are actually very inside, and, but have a lot of depth to them as well. Um, so, I, I mean, the album of his that changed my life was What Means Solid Traveler, which is on most of the streaming services. And I have literally spent most of my adult life trying to remake that album. That's just, that's, I keep trying to rip, rip that album off and not succeeding, but I'll keep trying. Um, that, and then, I feel a little sheepish saying this, but I, I've suddenly, like, quote-unquote, discovered John Hassel. Hmm. Um, and I don't know why it took this long, but for, for whatever reason, the light bulb went off lately. So now I've just been like every night I've been like digging through his stuff. Um, and, and there again, you know, it's, it's kind of like it's like John Peel said about the fall. I think, you know, it's always different and it's always the same, you know, like it's, it's a very distinctive identity. It's, it's always framed and presented in different ways. Um, and, and I guess that's part of what I aspire to as, as a music maker myself, you know, just having a strong enough identity and a strong enough musical personality that it can be presented in a lot of different contexts and a lot of different varieties, but still hopefully have some underlying cohesive aesthetic to it. That's great. And, and kudos. Yeah. I can't, I can't top that list for, you know, a hassle is, uh, yeah, very important to me too. And um, anyone who doesn't know John Hassel go check him out uh uh purportedly a trumpeter but uh, you know electronic musician and many people first heard him with uh talking heads uh, uh or or brian eno records and things like that but one of the one of the um the four um four parents of where we are um with this um and also andre uh, uh, coming up for you uh, teaching any gigs any kind of what's your next like three month snapshot anything no. Um, I would really like to ramp up the teaching and the, uh, the online presence, you know. Okay. Um, it's a weird situation because suddenly now there are two new hardware loopers on the market that are actually based on the thing that I've been using for 26 years. So I feel like I suddenly know. this repository of knowledge I have has gone from, you know, I've gone from being like an archaeologist to suddenly being like a consultant on, on two new things, which is great. But it's a very different thing. So I'm still kind of wrapping my head around that and the implications of that. <laughs> Okay. I'm uh, so sorry. That's so funny. The archaeologist comment. It's it's awesome. 
Yeah, you know, it's like, you know, if it, Matthias isn't going to write a software update for the EDP next week, you know, it's like the features. <laughs> right. and, 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 and then we're not going to get Mobius anytime soon, but at least it's at least now it has a chance. Yeah. Right. True. But, but now it's like, you know, at, at any time of the day or night, the developer could email me with a software update and suddenly it'll be a different kind of thing. So, I mean, it's really exciting to be in that position, but it also means that I have to stop thinking of my videos as being like, these definitive evergreen statements and being more like a periodical report, like, okay, here's where we're at right now with this version of the firmware, um, which is great, but it, it, you know, it's, I'm still wrapping my head around what that means. I, um, I like it. I, I like the periodical report part. And, and folks, again, uh, we have the links. Andre's YouTube is, is that's a great uh, way of putting it. It's like a little uh, newsletter on all these cool new items and how you can use them creatively. Again, breaking down that wall of, yeah, you got to learn the buttons and the switches, but I love that in the midst of it, you just start playing and showing us what's, yeah. So we're, 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 we'll follow up more on that. Todd, um, real quick from you, just two uh, no, two artists you can yeah. name that besides that brought us, you know. I'm really glad that you had, had Andre go first. He, he, he took two of the greats, so, uh, so I'm now, so, uh, so I, I'm not going to duplicate those. Here's one for you. Um, a now a, a band which has gone on before us into the ether, but whose music still remains called The Books. Hmm. They changed my life. And uh, I remain very, very good friends with one of them. I used to actually uh, tour with them and open for them for a very short time. Um, but but they but but they really they literally changed how I thought about about what was possible in music. So they're one. Then the second would be. Um, Somebody who I really love listening to is is Richard Devine. Mm. You know, in in Synthland, uh, really, really love. And any time I, I come across stuff of his, I really do enjoy it. All modular, you know. Um, yeah. But I but so there's 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 two. I'm I'm sure I could think of I could think about fifteen or twenty more, and I want to, and I want to tell you <laughs> all of them. But I right. think it's but it's time for me to. Receive. That's that's a good. That's two good, two good ones. Um, all right, and um, Wiz, give us uh, you know, you know any two artists that people should know that yeah, this is something that you know I, I checked out and I grew up with. Um, I mean, I think a, a really obvious one for me is Bjork, who just I feel like the the way that yeah, she's just like has made electronic music so like emotional and like the emotional vulnerability that she um delivers in her music and like both but like also the trans like the emotional transparency too so i think it can be kind of um i love electronic music and i love when it's abstract and um it but it's also really cool to like be very pointed about the emotion that's being expressed and like the bravery of that so i've been really inspired by her um as a youth and to this day and then another is Beast Nest, who's a friend of mine, um, who's an electronic musician. Um, and they're, it'll be really exciting when they're playing live shows again, because um, I don't know what they're doing with their EQ and their mixing, but it's all, it just, it feels like a sound bath. Like it just is so warm. And I, I feel, I don't know, I, every, every time I end up at one of their shows, I like am crying. Like, I'm just like, why am I crying? I need this, what's going on? So um, that's another that I feel really inspired by. Beast nest, mm -hmm. as in a bird's nest, is that this? Yes, yeah, like a bird's nest, beast, but a beast, beast for a nest. beast. <laughs> wow, okay, no, that, that this is, I'm, I'm jotting this all down. And the books, you know, I've heard that name, but I have no idea. Um, so, okay, that, that's awesome. Uh, thank you all for, for adding a few a few new things to my list. Um, wow. Well, that that let's wrap on that. You know, um, I think um, I knew this would be a challenge squeezing this into like ninety minutes, but I think I've hit my marks, which were to introduce uh, um, some viewers and listeners to some some new folks who have done a lot and keep doing a lot, and who have uh, um, a lot of um, a lot of stuff in front of them. And um, again, as I said, the, the, the record is just kind of an excuse to get us in the room. But I think uh, those of you who don't know this record, go listen to it. We've heard a few little snippets and we've heard it. It's a jumping point for the way we all think. Um, I, I, I always forget to put my little um, you can find me as Guitar Tour on Twitter and um, Instagram. And, and, you know, 
here on YouTube. All three of these wonderful humans are going to be back here on Make Weird Music because they make weird music, <laughs> you know, in, in the best way possible. And, and they're all very inspiring. And I want to thank them for their, their time on a Friday. Um, make sure you like and subscribe. Make sure you follow up all these folks on their band camps and Instagram. Join, make sure you join me next week, um, f next Friday, a week from Friday, to, uh, on, on the, the show um, Confronting Creativity. I've got... The wonderful saxophonist Skerrick, who is just another, you know, uh, kaleidoscopic artist like we've had tonight. Uh, he's, he's been all over the map and, and plays that sax like it's not a sax. And then I've got on Wednesday, July 7th, Tony Rolando, who is the brains and the genius behind Make Noise Music. And I got to always pause so I don't s mix up Make Weird Music, Make Noise Music. But uh, Make Noise, one of the greatest uh, synth companies and modular companies, just a mile from my house, actually. But we're going to be talking to Tony Rolando about, about all this. And then uh, in, in uh, three weeks, the 16th, very excited to have Dolette McDonald, who is another amazing singer, composer, performer, uh, and... Uh, a voice that's on uh, many, many, many records, whether it's Talking Heads or Sting or Laurie Anderson. And we're going to talk about that line also with performance art and strange music and also being in stadiums with, with <laughs> being st a creative person. So that's a lot of stuff coming up. Stay tuned. Um, and um, thank you for being part of Make Weird Music. All right. I'm going to sign off. Y'all can stay on for just a split second. And... Otherwise, see you YouTube folks soon. Um, okay, cool. We're off the air. Um.